Salvation in Deuteronomy, and Study 1, Going Out to Battle. Thank you, Brother Sam. Thanks, Brother Gary, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to start these studies with two quotes from the New Testament. The first one is Luke 24, verse 27, and these are the words of Christ. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So know what Christ says to these disciples on the road to Emmaus here. In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So everywhere we look in the scriptures, we should be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And a couple of verses earlier in Luke 24, he's called them fools and slow of heart for not matching up the scriptures with his life and his sufferings. And he highlights Moses amongst all the prophets. These disciples had watched the events of Christ's life and his death and his resurrection happen before their eyes in real time. But Christ still expected them to match up what they'd read in Moses' writings with the confusing blur of events that they'd just witnessed. Now we know that Christ and his mission, his life, his death, his resurrection, it's all through the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus obviously wanted to show his disciples here. But no particularly that he singles out the writings of Moses. Do you want to know about me, says the Lord Jesus Christ? Read Moses' writings. And clearly, Moses knew a lot about Christ, and that is revealed particularly in his exposition of the law, which is uh, Moses' writings of Deuteronomy. And I think that this weekend's study show that perhaps Moses knew a whole lot more about Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection than we may have previously thought. He certainly understood the principles of salvation, God's grace and God's forgiveness, and our inability to save ourselves through the law or through any other method. But from what we're going to see this weekend, hopefully, he must have known many more details about the mission uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his mortal life. The second quote is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9 to 10. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for the oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. So here's the Apostle Paul commenting, somewhat incidentally, I guess, on a verse from Deuteronomy 25. But in doing so, he poses a really important question about the interpretation of the law, and particularly the book of Deuteronomy. And it's a question you can ask yourself as we read through the book of Deuteronomy. Doth God take care for the oxen? or saith he it altogether for our sakes. So there's plenty of quirky, uh, weird, obscure laws in the book of Deuteronomy, a few of which we're going to look at this weekend. And every time you come across one of these odd-looking laws, we need to ask ourselves the question, doth God take care of the oxen, or saith he it for our sakes? In other words, what's the lesson that God is trying to teach us from this obscure law that is written down in the book of Deuteronomy? Is it just what it seems on the surface? Well, no, says Paul. There's always more. There's always a principle. And it's that principle that we're endeavouring to uncover this weekend. So our aim this weekend is, as Moses intended, to look past the surface of the law, to look into the weirdness, I guess, and the oddities contained in the book of Deuteronomy and see what we can find out about salvation, about the Messiah, about atonement, about, as Christ put it, things concerning himself. And specifically, we're going to look at images that resonate down through 1,500 years of time to the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for things hidden in the law, Easter eggs, if you like, that Moses has deliberately put into Deuteronomy to foreshadow the life of Jesus. If you're over 15, then we're looking for images, types, shadows, Bible echoes that have been inserted into Deuteronomy that are, frankly, astounding predictions about Jesus Christ's work. Now, I know that some of you um, in the audience are no fans of types and shadows. You aren't particularly interested in the law of Moses. Moses. 
And to you I say, well, that's slightly unfortunate. You might want to take the early bus back to Beth Salem. But as Paul said to the Gentile Corinthians, doth God take care of the oxen? Did God write these things down because of his care for the oxen or has he written them down for our sakes? Whether we're Gentile Corinthians in the first century, not law keepers, or Gentile Australians in the 21st century. He wrote them for our sakes, for us to examine and to interpret in the light uh, of the life of the Son of God, as recorded in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. A final quote, this time not from the New Testament, but from um, Brother Dennis Gillett's studies on the book of Deuteronomy. And he said, In the book of Deuteronomy, there are words which are central and fundamental to the discipleship of Christ. They, the words of Deuteronomy, were spoken a long time ago, measured in human time. But they were not spoken incidentally, and they were not spoken dispensationally. They were spoken essentially. They were spoken universally because they were spoken on the basis of principles that are perpetual and timeless. Things which were true then, things which are true now. This is why we need to bother ourselves with the book of Deuteronomy because the principles here are eternal. They might be obscure, but that doesn't make them irrelevant. Now, most of us will know that the book of Deuteronomy was given as an extended speech by Moses right at the end of his life, as Brother Gary's reminded of us. At the end of the 40 years that uh, Israel spent in the wilderness, just before they entered the promised land. The law itself, of course, was delivered in the books of Exodus and Leviticus uh, and Numbers to a certain extent at Horeb. So by the time he delivers Deuteronomy, uh, Moses has had 40 years to think about the law. He's had 40 years to add to the law and add it together with his knowledge of the book of Genesis. He's had 40 years to meditate and to reflect on the law. And here in the book of Deuteronomy, we have his distilled wisdom from those 40 years. So after 40 years, what does Moses want to say? What's he trying to achieve in this book of Deuteronomy? Well, his aim is twofold, but it makes it a very fine line for him to walk. On one hand, he wants Israel to keep the law. He knows that's important for their civil structures for their religious development for the next 1,500 or so years. He knows the law is holy and just and good, but he also knows that it won't save them eternally. Moses knows that the law is just a schoolmaster to lead Israel to Christ. So he has this fine balancing act to maintain. On the one hand, encourage them to keep the law, and on the other hand, try and get them to see the limitations of the law, to look for the principles behind the law. Now, as history attests, of course, Israel failed in both directions. Initially, they failed to keep the law for much of their history. There were exceptional periods, of course, uh, under the leadership of Joshua and uh, David, for example, uh, where the law was implemented. But for most of the records of the judges and most of the kings, Israel failed to keep the law. Then once they came back from captivity, um, from Babylon, they went to the other extreme that Moses was trying to get them to avoid. Instead of failing to keep the law, they add to it, adding their own traditions and rituals until the law became just that, a bunch of meaningless traditions and rituals enforced by a bunch of hypocritical legalists. Now, Moses knows that, knows that both of these extremes are possible. And in fact, he probably knows that they're inevitable. But Deuteronomy is his attempt to prevent both of these things happening. So, as I said, he has a very fine line to tread. He wants Israel to keep the law, but at the same time recognise the limitations of the law. So, how does he do this? Well, he does it in lots of different ways. And we're not going to go into any of these in huge detail, apart from the final one, because we really want to start on, on uh, chapter 20. But... Here are just some of the ways that Moses treads this tricky path of trying to get Israel to keep the law, but also to look beyond the law. So he emphasises the stick uh, and reduces the carrot. He emphasises the punishments under the law and uh, really minimal, and points out how limited the, 
the benefits of keeping the law are in, in terms of eternal salvation. He points out the law's wobbly foundations. So he goes to great extremes to point out um, when the law was given at Sinai, how, how terrible that situation was with the golden calf uh, and even their high priest being involved in that. He downplays his own role as though he knows that the law is going to get named after him um, and his own inability to get them into the promised land. He emphasises the spiritual and downplays the literal. And he inserts additional strange laws that are intended to provoke thought. And it's that final point, these additional strange laws that he's inserted is where we're going in these studies on this weekend to look at some of these strange additional laws that Moses has inserted. None of the laws that we look at uh, are in Exodus or in Leviticus or in Numbers. They're unique to the book of Deuteronomy. So Moses actually adds to the law in the book of Deuteronomy. He adds to the law that God's already delivered them at Sinai, just in case there wasn't enough convoluted detail already. Moses goes and adds yet another layer to the law. Why is that? Because he wants to complicate their lives further? Well, no, because he wants to push their minds and our minds further. He wants the Jews and us to think about the principles and the prophecies behind the law. So our aim is to show the links between Deuteronomy and the gospel records of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, to show, in fact, that Deuteronomy is a gospel record, a detailed record of the mission, life and death and resurrection of the true Saviour, not just of Israel, but of all humanity. So, with that uh, in mind, let's start in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 20. Now, I hope you noted as we were reading through it, or as uh, Brother Andrew was reading through it, that this chapter is uh, all about the rules of waging warfare. And hopefully one of the first things you noted about this first section of Deuteronomy 20 was the huge contradiction uh, in the chapter. The first four uh, verses of the chapter are all about encouragement. It didn't matter who they were fighting or how many they were fighting. Uh, The message of verse 1 is, don't be afraid. And then the priest comes along and reinforces that encouraging message in uh, verses 2 to 4. And the priest says it in four different ways. He says, don't be afraid, let not your hearts faint, fear not, do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. So four different ways the priest comes along and says, don't be afraid. And what's the reason for Israel's lack of... Of fear Was it because they had the best trained army or because they had the toughest soldiers or because they had the biggest army, because they had the latest military equipment perhaps? No, of course not. It's because of verse 4. For Yahweh your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you. Don't be afraid, says the priest, because God is going to go and fight with you. And more than that, because God is going to go and fight with you, God is going to go and fight for you. Really, all they had to do was turn up for the fight and God would do the rest. They can't lose. God has promised he will save them. That's the message from both God in the first verse and from the priest in the next three verses. But then the the tone changes dramatically. Along come the officers in verse 5 to 9 and they have quite a different message. Got a new house? Don't worry about fighting. Got a new vineyard? Don't worry about fighting. About to get married? Don't worry about fighting. In fact, even if you're just a little bit scared, don't worry about the fighting. Leave it to other people. So there's quite a contrasting message, isn't there? See the contradiction between the two messages. First, the priest says, don't be scared because God is going to fight with you and for you, in fact. And then the officers come along. And they offer any slightest excuse for the men to leave the battle, including the the excuse of fear itself. Which of these two contradictory messages would instil faith and courage? And which would instil fear and doubt, do you think? Who should the Israelites listen to? The priest or the officers? Now, when Moses mentions the priest... It's almost always the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Hebrews 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So the priest is Christ. The King James Version has the word officers in verses 5 to 9 and we could be forgiven for thinking that they're talking about army officers but the word shota, the Hebrew word shota actually means to write and there's nothing military about the term at all. It's more accurately translated as scribes and these scribes aren't fighting types at all. They aren't leading the people into battle. Have a look at verse 9. It says, And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. The officers don't lead the people into battle. As soon as they've done their job of discouraging the people, they disappear from the record and presumably from the battlefield. And the people have to appoint captains from their own number to actually lead them in battle. Now the word captain is a term of military leadership. So after offering all the excuses, the scribes don't lead the people into battle, fighting's not for them. Having undermined the strength of the army, they retire from the battlefield well before the hard work begins. And leadership in warfare has to come from other sources, from among the fighting men themselves. So here we have two conflicting messages, one of faith and encouragement coming from our priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and another of doubt and of fear delivered by none other than the scribes, who, of course, turn into Christ's New Testament opponents who offer every excuse as to why we shouldn't engage in battle. Now, when we mention the word battle or warfare, uh, because we've all read the New Testament, we know that the battles we fight are not physical wars. Uh, They're not the type that Israel was about to face when they entered the Promised Land. The battle, our battle, is against sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So we're not fighting against the flesh uh, in a literal sense, says Paul. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The wars we fight are spiritual, and mostly they're internal. We're not even really fighting against people. You notice that Paul doesn't mention people in his list of things that we're fighting. Imaginations, things that exalt against the knowledge of God, thoughts. Not other people's thoughts, our thoughts. We're fighting ideologies. We're fighting fleshly thinking in all its forms. Pride, lust, false doctrine. And most of that fighting is in our own minds, the battlefield of human pride. And what does our priest tell us? Go and fight this battle on your own, does he say? It's a battle you can't win. Does he encourage fear or confidence? Does he discourage us from fighting? No, our priest tells us in Romans 8.37, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through our own strength, our own weapons, our superior numbers? No, through him who loved us. The battle against sin is ours to be won, but it's not us that wins the battle. It is Christ, our fighting priest. He wins the battle for us. Our lack of fear isn't some sort of mistaken self-confidence. It is Christ's confidence, confidence in him, confidence that he will easily win the day. Well, what was the scribe's philosophy, on the other hand? The legalist, legalist doesn't really believe that the fight can be won. The legalist wants to place limits on your compliance. You only have to go so far, they say. Don't give everything to the battle. Here's a few loopholes to get you out from fighting the good fight. And the biggest loophole of all? Well, it's fear. Fear. Fear, the defeater of faith. Fear, the weapon that sin, uh, the weapon of sin that means that sin will always win. Fear means that there will be no fight. And if there's no fight, then sin wins by forfeit. And the legalist doesn't fight the battle himself. He's too busy with compliance, with technicalities. To him, the technicalities are more important than the actual fight, 
The legalists will battle anyone about the rules, but the battle against human pride, well, he lost that fight years ago. Well, what else does Deuteronomy 20 tell us about fighting wars? Well, in verse 10 to 18... Uh, it gives us two different approaches to the battle, depending on who the enemy was. There's one battle campaign for the inhabitants of the Promised Land who are listed for us in verse 17, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites, etc. So there's one uh, approach for them and quite a different approach for those that are described as being very far off from thee in verse 15. Those cities that are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of the nations listed in verse 17. So those that are far off uh, get um, a, the option of a peaceful settlement. Their life in exchange for service. If they reject that option, then war is declared. But even then, they get a slightly more gentle treatment than those that are near. When Israel defeats them, and there's no doubt in this record, in the spirit of verse 4, that Israel will be victorious. When Israel defeats them, all the males are killed, but as verse 14 says, women and children and cattle are kept alive, and the wealth of the city can be taken for a spoil. By the way of contrast, of course, those nations in the inheritance promised, those that are near, get no such leeway, no offer of peace, straight into war. No keeping of anything alive. Verse 16, at the end of that verse, says, Save alive nothing that breatheth. Uh, no cattle, no women, no children, uh, no men. Verse 17, utterly destroy them. And this different treatment between uh, uh, those, uh, the treatment between the far and the near is, of course, the loophole that the Gibeonites exploited. Remember in Joshua chapter 9, they came to Joshua with you know, worn clothes and moldy bread per every Sunday school project, pretending that they were from afar when actually they were Amorites. Uh, they wanted to get the far city treatment when they were actually a near city. So just keep that in mind, two different types of campaign for two uh, different enemies. The far get a, a proclamation of peace and the near get utter destruction. And then the final section of uh, Deuteronomy 20 concerns the treatment of trees in a siege situation. Now, this seems like a very practical law on the face of it, doesn't it? Uh, don't cut down the fruit trees to make siege weapons because they're going to produce fruit to eat. Uh, all very sensible. But if there's ever a moment that you should be asking yourself, doth God take care for the oxen? Well, then this is it. Doth God take care of the trees? Well, saith he it all together for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. What do trees represent in Scripture? Well, often they're used to represent people and people's lives. Uh, a sample of, tree, uh, of quotes here connect uh, trees with the life of men, specific men, Exodus chapter 9, Jeremiah 7, and Joel 1. Trees are used to represent specific men, uh, such as Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, which we know uh, quite well, or Amaziah, the king of Judah, in 2 Kings 14, verse 9. And John the Baptist, of course, draws a clear parallel between trees and men, uh, and the fruit of the tree being the character of the man, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 9. And John the Baptist there says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And in the previous verse, John has exhorted them to bring forth fruits of repentance. Now, we know that he's not talking about literal trees and literal fruit, but about the people listening to him and their need to produce spiritual fruit. The, spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, of course, being those characteristics described in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. But we don't even have to go into the New Testament, of course, to work out that that's what trees represent because Moses tells us right here in Deuteronomy chapter 20. In the middle of verse 19, Moses says, For the tree of the field is man's life. 
Now you'll notice from the amount of uh, italic font uh, for life there in, in verse 19 uh, and the marginal references that the translators have had uh, some struggle to try and translate this phrase. Many translations frame the, the phrase as a question. Is the, tree, uh, uh, is the tree of the field a man? But the Hebrew really is uh, simply just four words. Four tree, field, man. Why don't we cut down the fruit trees, asked Moses? Because the tree of the field is man. Here's the symbol, says Moses. I'll crack the code for you. Trees represent men. If they're going to be fruitful, we don't want to kill them. John the Baptist told us that, yes, if they produce no fruit, then uh, chop them down. But Moses is putting the converse point here, isn't he? If men are fruit producing, then they should live, says Moses. And that really is the point of our spiritual warfare, isn't it? That's why we condemn sin, but not necessarily the sinner who may not know any better. The whole point of the battle against sin is to produce fruit. There's no point in employing a scorched earth policy in the battle against sin, otherwise we'd all be dead because we're all sinners. If no spiritual fruit is produced by our battle, then it's pointless. How does killing everything give glory to God? Putting the flesh to death is only half the battle. The more positive, useful, beautiful, productive part is, of course, walking in newness of life, producing the fruits of repentance, producing the fruit of the Spirit. So what have we seen from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 20? Where does that leave us? We've seen the priest's message of hope, don't fear, uh, versus the scribe's message of, uh, of calamity, or I guess of fear, the excuses that they offer, and they offer three excuses. We've seen two different campaigns, one to those who are near, which is going to be of utter destruction, and then we've seen a different campaign that's going to be to those who are far off, and that's uh, a campaign of peace and the option of, make, of them becoming servants. And we've seen that uh, we don't cut down the fruit trees if we're laying siege to a city because they are men's lives. Well, where does that leave us? So just remember that the whole thesis of these talks is that the, the, this book is a gospel record. So we should expect these themes uh, to be reflected in the ministry of our Lord, shouldn't we? Now, Christ wasn't a soldier uh, at his first event. He ran no military campaigns, but he did run two preaching campaigns. And like the military campaigns of Deuteronomy 20, Christ's preaching campaigns had two different approaches to two different classes of people. Come to Matthew chapter 10. And here we find the first campaign to the first group of people. So Matthew chapter 10, and uh, in these first 12 verses of this chapter, um, or the first section of this chapter, the 12 disciples are sent out. So Matthew 10 verse 1, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So what does he send them out to do, to fight? Well, not literally. But where the battle against sin is represented by the enemies in Deuteronomy 20, here the battle against sin is represented by something else. In verse 1, unclean spirits, sicknesses, diseases, illness in all its forms, mental and physical, uh, is a good symbol of sin because it came into the world as a result of sin. And which class of people did these 12 go to? Verse 5, not into the way of the Gentiles or any city of the Samaritans, but, in verse 6, just to the house of Israel. So here's our first group, those that are near in the terms of Deuteronomy 20. And just as Israel was about to establish the kingdom of God in the promised land after Deuteronomy 20, so too these 12 are so in the beginning of the kingdom of heaven within the confines of the promised land in Matthew chapter 10. But their weapons now aren't physical. The weapons now are just words. But what powerful words. These are the words 
preaching the gospel message, the words of healing from sin and from death. Have a look at verse 7. It says, uh, as you go slaughter. No, it says, as you go preach. Preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8, heal, cleanse, raise the dead, cast out demons. This spiritual battle is going to be one long conquest over sin and death using just words and healing as the weapons. And yet where are these weapons going to come from? Did these disciples spend hours preparing what they were going to say uh, to conquer the enemy within their own nation? Verse 19 and 20, Take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. They didn't need to become professional soldiers. Christ was going to provide their weapons. And not only that, he was going to do the fighting for them. Just like Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, For Yahweh your God is he that goeth with you to fight against your enemy to save you. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20, For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, Yahweh your God, which speaketh in you. And what was the message of the priest in Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 3? Let not your uh, let your hearts let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. And what does the true priest say in Matthew chapter ten and verse twenty six? Fear not. And again in verse twenty eight, fear not them which kill the body. Again in verse thirty one, fear ye not therefore. And is there going to be the option of peace for those that are near? Remember those cities within the Promised Land in Deuteronomy 20 were not given the option of peace. It was going to be all-out war with them. Matthew 10 and verse 34. Think not that I am come to send that I am come to send on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. The nation of Israel was not to be given quarter in Jesus' day. To use the Western phrase, the town wasn't big enough for both of them. The town wasn't big enough for both the ideology of the Pharisees and Christ's new way of thinking. It was one or the other. There could be no compromise, no peace treaty between them. People were going to have to choose between life and death. There was no third way. Now, if the Jews had realised it at the time, they would have seen the irony of what they had become in Matthew chapter 10. They, the chosen people of God, had become the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites of Deuteronomy 20. This new kingdom of God was about to be established and now it was them that were in the way of it. And God was about to use the same scorched earth policy on them that he had used on the Canaanites in Moses and Joshua's time. Then, of course, there's a second campaign because, like in Deuteronomy 20, there was a second group of people who would be treated quite differently in Jesus' uh, preaching campaigns. Come to Luke's record now uh, in Luke chapter 10. So just so we can get our bearings, have a look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. He called his 12 together and in verse 2 sent them to preach. So here's that same preaching campaign that we read about in Matthew chapter 10, the sending of the 12 disciples to the cities of Judea. But there was a second group then sent out in the next chapter in Luke chapter 10. And this time there wasn't 12, the number of the, the tribes of Israel, but 70 Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city that he would come. So not 12, the number of Israel this time, now it's 70, the number of the tribes of the Gentiles. This group isn't limited now to the cities of Israel, but those outside Jewish jurisdiction, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. Note in verse 5, whatsoever house in verse 8 whatsoever city in verse 10 whatsoever city these preachers were going everywhere and anywhere and they had a different approach too. remember the cities are far off in in Deuteronomy chapter 20 they had the option of accepting a peace treaty 
verse 11 of uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, verse 5, sorry, of Luke chapter 10. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. This wasn't the no hold bars, uh, no holds barred approach of the Jewish preaching campaign. This is a campaign of peace. Now we know that in Ephesians, Paul calls the, and contrasts the Jews and the Gentiles by calling them those that were near to God near to his temple, near to his scriptures, uh, the Jews, obviously, and those that were far off from all of that, the Gentiles. The battle campaigns against the near and the far in Deuteronomy 20 have now become two preaching campaigns to the Jews and to the Gentiles. In fact, Christ really uh, contrasts the two groups of recipients in verse 13 of Luke chapter 10. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida, he says. Two, woe unto these two Jewish cities. For if the mighty works that had been done in thee had been done in Tyre and Sidon, two Gentile cities, they had a great while repent, ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So what's the end result going to be? Well, it was going to be complete destruction for the cities within the borders of the Promised Land, come AD 70 those that had had every opportunity to repent over the past 1,500 years. Verse 14, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, for the Gentiles, those that are far off, at the judgment seat than for you, the Jewish cities that were near. So what other themes do we find uh, in Deuteronomy 20 that we might find, expect to find in this section of Luke? Well, remember the excuses for not fighting. There were three of them. I would fight, but I've just built my own house. Or I've just planted my own vineyard. Or I've just betrothed a wife. Remember those uh, three excuses? Are we going to go into battle with our Lord or not? What excuses can we find to legalise our way out of fighting? Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. A certain man said... I will follow thee. That's us, isn't it? I mean, we say, here am I, send me. I'm ready for the battle. But Jesus said unto him in verse 58, what about your new house? Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Aren't you really more interested in your new house? Asks Jesus. Verse 59, he says to another, follow me. But he said, let me first go and bury my father. I'm coming, Lord, but not just yet. Verse 61, another, a third, also said, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell which are at home, at my house. Three calls to follow, to preach, to wage a good warfare, and three excuses why we can't. And who offered these excuses? Well, it doesn't tell us in Luke, but in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19, Matthew 8 and verse 19, it says it was a certain scribe. The scribes, the legalists, always looking for the loophole, always limiting God and his power to win the battle, just as Moses had predicted in Deuteronomy 20. So we've seen the two classes of enemy, those that are near and those that are far. We've seen the two different approaches that Christ takes to them. We've seen the three excuses offered by the scribes. We've seen the priest's exhortation to fear not because, because God will do the fighting for them. All those themes of Deuteronomy 20 are here. But what about the fruit trees? Where's the exhortation not to cut down the fruit trees? Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. Christ is set on the path to Jerusalem. And in verse 52, he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans. Keep that phrase in mind. They entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And James and John take great offence at this and they say in verse 54, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Want us to obliterate them, Lord, they ask. 
But he turned and rebuked them and said, don't cut down the fruit trees. Well, almost. He says in verse 56, the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Why does Christ want these Samaritans saved? Because he knows that despite the outward appearances that they are fruit trees. Remember Deuteronomy 20 verse 19, the tree of the field is man's life. Luke chapter 9 verse 56, the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives. I'm not here to chop down fruit trees in this war, he says. Now his disciples can't see it now, but later on they can. Later they can see that these apparently unfruitful Samaritans are in fact fruit-bearing trees. What happens several years later in in Acts chapter 8? Well, in verse 5, Philip went down to a city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And in verse 6, the Samaritans respond. So if James and John had wiped them out back in Luke chapter 9, this harvest would never, of course, have been possible. And in verse 8, there's great joy in in the city at this response to the gospel. There's fruit already brought forth, joy, one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Here are our fruit trees beginning to produce fruit. Verse 14, who do the the, uh, apostles send to confirm what's happening? They send Peter and John. Now, and they uh, they give them the Holy Spirit gifts in uh, verse 15 to 17. So here's John, no longer wanting to send fire from heaven, no longer wanting to cut down the fruit trees. Instead, he's there giving the Holy Spirit gifts to these fruit producing trees. Verse 25 of Acts chapter 8, which still refers to uh, Peter and John. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to the Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Villages of the Samaritans, a direct reference here back to Luke chapter 9 and verse 52. So in laying siege to this city of the Samaritans, James and John want a scorched earth policy. Cut down all the fruit trees, they say. No, says Christ. Some of these are fruit trees. We don't cut them down. You may not be able to see it now, but they will bear fruit later. What does this say about our approach to waging warfare against the power of sin? It does say that we we have to be very careful that we don't take this scorched earth approach that John and James literally wanted to happen here, even against those who seem completely opposed to Christ. We can't tell who eventually, maybe not now, maybe years later, but eventually is going to respond to the call of the gospel. It's not for us to write people off, to assume that God can't work with someone, no matter how depraved or opposed to the face of Jesus they may seem right now. We just don't know. To limit God's power to save anyone that he chooses... Well, that's not our role, is it? Our role is to follow him whithersoever he goes. Our role is to go and preach the kingdom of God. What's our campaign? Well, it's described for us in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And fear not, because I'm going to fight for you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 